that is the church family. And what she just said is important, what we're talking about in these days of the new creation. It's so easy, as she, Carly, said it, to pull away, to pull away from God. What is it that pulls us away from God? That was the issue of the book of Galatians. And I want us to turn in chapter 2 of Galatians this morning. We're going to be looking at that passage of Scripture beginning in chapter 2. I would ask you this morning, how would you define the word apocalypse? If you had to define apocalypse, uh, I would dare say that in our culture we would hear probably something along the lines of something to do with the end of the world or the destruction of the world, and you would be right. I went to the dictionary some time ago to look at this word apocalypse, and I was a little bit shocked because they actually confirm what we would tend to think in the culture, that the word apocalypse is complete final destruction of the world as described in the biblical book of Revelation. It talks about an event evolving destruction or damage or an awesome or catastrophic scale of destruction. That's how we think about apocalypse. And we probably find that in our culture. If you've noticed in the culture that apocalypse usually is tied to all kinds of end of the world, mass deaths. We've attached it to zombies and imminent catastrophes that threaten the planet and all of the human race. In fact, regardless of the news source, you may listen to, there's a constant barrage of warnings that are threatening our planet all the way from climate change to the recession in the economy, the future of politics, a constant health emergencies almost every week. And I've noticed in the headlines that we read most of the time, when I just read the headlines, usually there's these words, might, may, coming, could be. It's never just the realities. It's always the fear of the future of something terrible that's coming to the planet. Constant threats of doomsday is the world we live in. Perhaps Joss Whedon, a creative and intelligent screenwriter, producer who has become famous for films like Toy Story. Anybody ever seen Toy Story? You got grandkids, you've watched that a couple of times. And The Avengers, he wrote, Part, produced part of the Avengers as well. He reflects the sentiment of the age in a recent interview in Entertainment Weekly. Whedon was asked if he had any hope that the human race is becoming smarter and better. <laughs> Whedon said, I think we're actually becoming stupider and more petty. What's going on in this country and many countries is beyond depressing. It's terrifying. Sometimes I have to remember who I'm talking to. I'll say something about how terrible things are and meaningless and the world is headed toward destruction and war and apocalypse. And at one point, my daughter goes, hey, dad, I'm eight. I'm only eight. You make it sound like I don't have any future in this world. And yet he went on to confess and I put it in your notes this morning. I can't believe anybody thinks we're actually going to make it before we destroy the planet. I honestly think it's inevitable. I have no hope. I want to be wrong more than anything. I hate to say it. It's that line from the Lord of the Rings. You may recall this. I give hope to men. I keep none for myself. As I think about the word apocalypse as, a, as defined by the culture and what I've just read to you, I've, I'm afraid that the church is not exempt, the church of Jesus Christ. If we take our cues from the media and if we take our cues from all that's going on in the world in the entertainment world, we would begin to think that all is lost and we live in kind of this pessimistic culture and society that is afraid of the future and then you throw in a pandemic and a recession and political division and the threat of Marxist dictators who are constantly threatened to blow up another country almost every week of the year at this point in time. It's not hard to think that we might be approaching the apocalypse. You might think that that's a new thing in the Bible, that it's something that would come at the end times. But in reality, the apocalypse 
is more than just a particular interpretation of the book of Revelation. It was going on in the Apostle Paul's world in local churches that he had planted and pastored. And he found himself in the middle of an apocalypse, if you can use the term, in the Roman world. The Roman emperors in the palace ranged from all, the, all of those who were tolerant to the Jews and the Christians to outright hatred and persecution of the Jews depending on what was going on. And they had all of the government surrounding them. In fact, they had a senate. They had legislative body in the Roman Empire that would be very similar in some ways to our form of government. And they would vote laws into place that were standing as long as the emperor was supportive of it. And if the emperor didn't like it, he could make all kinds of executive orders that would adversely affect Christians and Jews, especially in the culture. And for the whole, the society tolerated the Christians and the Jews, basically as long as they did not talk about any particular one God. As long as you were polytheistic, as long as you could talk about many gods, you could have as many gods and be as religious as you wanted to be in the Roman culture. But when you started talking, as the Jews did, about one God, or the Christians who talked about Jesus is the only Lord, that became fighting words for the Romans, and it created problems in the culture. That was a problem for both the Christians and the Jews in the middle of the first century because they were fiercely monotheistic. And, and for example, in A.D. 49, the Empress Claudius decided that the Jews and the Christians were in conflict with each other in the Christian church. And so he expelled the Jews from Rome. He banned them from living in Rome. And it was at the same time that the Apostle Paul with his friend Barnabas had climbed a hundred miles up into the mountains of what is now modern day Turkey and he had planted the church among the province of Galatia with these new Christians at the same time preaching the gospel to the Gentiles and this decree lasted for five years under this particular emperor. And what happened when that five years was over, the Christians began to experience persecution, and they began to experience that, but then there was a new thing that happened into the life of the church. You see, the Jews who had been expelled were able to start coming back into Rome. And when they came back into Rome, they found a church that was totally different than the church that they had left. They found a church that was run by the customs of the Gentiles and not the Jewish law. And now they had a different church with different styles of worship. And they were deeply disturbed by that and it affected all of the Christian churches throughout the whole Roman Empire, including these churches that Paul had pastored and planted in Galatia. And they were coming into the church and saying, well, you know, this Jesus message is really a good message. We like it. We, we believe in Jesus too, but let's not get crazy about this Jesus guy because the fact is Jesus has simply helped us to see what the law and the practices of the Jewish customs are really all about. And if you go back to the Torah and the scripture, they were misinterpreting what God had intended for one nation to birth the Messiah they were taking the symbols, one of them the circumcision, and making that the, the catch-all for what it means to have a right relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. And so they came with a different gospel, a, a gospel that said Jesus and, as we talked about last week, in some detail. And the faith that they had was great, but they were struggling with it. And the Galatian believers, the Gentile believers, begin to buy into this double message. 
And Paul was beside himself with shock. He's out of his head because what he has heard and known and understood in the person of Jesus Christ, that Jesus can come and transform a person, as we sang this morning, transform us and take us out of our feelings alone and do something different and make us a new person in Christ Jesus. They were trying to water that down to a Jesus and, and the apocalypse was happening right inside the local church. It wasn't from the outside. It was right in the body of believers. And the Apostle Paul, as we noted and will continue to note in Galatians chapter 6, verse 15, sums up all of what we'll be talking about in these next several weeks. And he sums it up. He says, there's nothing else that matters but the new creation in Christ. But these teachers were bringing a new creation with a different definition. They thought the new creation gave them permission to create their own version of a new creation based on what they feel is right. What they feel from their preferences and their convictions and their experiences. That's how you judged your relationship spiritually. They wanted a new creation that picks certain portions of the Bible. Well, I like, I like that part. That's a good part. Isn't that comforting? I love that in my devotions. But over here, that, them are some hard words. I don't get a God who does that. I, I'll just tear that out. And so they were picking and choosing what part of the Word of God that they were going to accept because it didn't match up with the way I feel or the way that I experience things in my life. And they were taking the Scriptures and totally twisting it, and the church was in jeopardy. Paul understood why they were doing that because he did it himself. He had spent his whole life persecuting the church and persecuting Christians because they didn't follow the ways of what he thought. He didn't understand who Jesus was in relationship to the Old Testament until he had a Damascus Road experience in which he was knocked off his horse with a bright light and he had come to a transforming change and relationship with Jesus in his life. So he at this point knows where they're coming from and he can't wait to visit them. He grabs his quill and pen and he begins to write them this letter. He doesn't even use a normal salutations and greetings before he jumps right into the apocalypse of what's going on in this local church. And he continues his defense that we began to look at in chapter 1. He begins in chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. I want us just to read it so you catch the context of the whole. And he writes, Then after 14 years, verse 1, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I took Titus along with me, and I went in response to a revelation. If you have a paper Bible or you have a highlighter in your electronic Bible, you might want to highlight that phrase right there. I went in response to a revelation. We'll talk about that in a moment. And meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter rose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, is also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles." James, Cephas, and John, these esteemed pillars of the church, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. When they recognized the grace given to me, they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised, and all they asked that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do all along. And when Cephas came to Antioch, 
Now here's the conflict. Here's the apocalypse. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. And the other Jews joined him in the hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. And when I saw that they weren't acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. We who are Jews by birth are not sinful Gentiles. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith in Christ Jesus. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified or saved. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. For if I rebuild what I've destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For verse 19, through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. And then the famous words, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. How do we relate to that? You say, what does that have to do with the 21st century church? What does that have to do with us? What does it have to do with the Christian church at all? I don't know about you, but I haven't sat around too many meals recently or in a coffee shop having discussions about the health benefits of circumcision. Have you? I don't think so. But here is this apocalypse. We haven't talked about eating ten pork tenderloins. That's not a big issue. What is the apocalypse? What are the dividing issues that are present in the church that threaten to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ? I would like to suggest to you this morning that there is a principle that's at work in our world and in the church. It's come and infiltrated into the Christian church, and I found it everywhere I went across 10 states, 8,000 miles in the seven weeks that I was on sabbatical. I found it in all of those in three or four different denominations. It's not just one place or one local church. It's there. What, what are the divisions? Here's, here's the principle that I discovered. When we talk about new creation, when we talk about conversion, when we talk about coming to a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to define the new creation in our terms based on my personal experiences, and my feelings. We want to create our own version of new. We want to create our own version of the biblical moral issues that are at stake. We want to, for instance, decide when life begins and when it ends. We want to control that in our lives. We want to define love in our terms apart from the holiness of God as the creator who created all things and created us and called us very good, we want to redefine what that human creation should look like and what it should act like in our own terms. We want to say to God's very good in the Genesis 1 story, we want to say in our culture, not good enough. It doesn't fit us. It doesn't fit our times. We want to create a different reality. We want to define which part of the Bible is revelation and which part of it is human error. And we want to play with that for a while in our discussions. We want to determine how we get to and when we can express our own sexuality. We want to determine that based on my feelings 
and my experience and what I think. And we even want to choose our sexual orientation based on what I think and what I feel and, and, and what I've experienced. We want to create our own reality. In fact, we've come to a place where we've taken the creation story where God said he created man in his own image, male and female created he them, and we want to create a new creation that has 57 genders. The last time I checked. And we begin to live in that and call it normal in our culture and our lives. And we want to define who is a Christian and who's not a Christian based on politics. We want to define who, who is and, and based on who they vote for or don't vote for. We want to determine who's in and who's out in their lives. And I've come to the place in the last seven weeks that I've read extensively about this divide that's coming into the life of the church in which we want to tie an unholy racist nationalism to Christ and the church on one side, but then refuse to allow authentic Christians to be authentic patriots who love their country without placing their country above the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's possible to do that. And we want to define it based on our feelings. We want to decide what it means to love God and love our neighbor based on my feelings. What I've, what I've been shocked in about is that every time we have a discussion about what's going on in the culture, it is very, very rare that somebody begins the conversation with, let's talk about what the Bible says. Let's talk about what the Word of God says. Let's talk about Genesis 1. Let's talk about how God created what He calls normal. We never want to start from that. We don't want to look at the Scripture. We don't want to listen to the apostolic tradition of the apostolic teaching of the apostles that we understand in the inspired Word of God. No, that's not where we want to start. Where I want to start is, I want to start with what I think and what I experience. And that was not unlike the Galatians. That was exactly the argument of the Galatians. The Judaizers, the Jewish folks, Christians were coming into the life of the church. And they were afraid. The reason they wanted everybody to come back to circumcision and to follow the law, the Jewish customs, because they were afraid that this freedom in Christ would lead the Gentiles to be able to do anything they wanted to in the culture. They thought that these Gentiles would end up being wild and dirty and unhealthy and filthy and unholy in their living. And they thought they would keep on killing their children in abortion like they had been doing for centuries. And they were into pedophilia and sex slave trade and homosexuality and religious orgies. That was the Roman culture in the first century read the history and the Jews were afraid that this freedom in Christ would not stop that behavior that they would just go on and live any old way they wanted to in any way they wanted to and whatever they felt like and what they experienced they had no concept of the Holy Spirit as we'll talk about in the next few chapters in the weeks to come they had no concept that Jesus through the Holy Spirit could actually transform and change somebody in their thinking until they're not worried about what I feel or I've experienced they've had a radical transformation that Carly talked about where we begin to see what God wants in my life and I believe that he can take what I call normal and I, he can take it and change it to make it like Jesus Christ we don't believe that takes place they were afraid of that and so they begin to fight so I went back as I've read, read the, this passage to you and I thought you know what what is what are some of the issues besides the culture that we fuss about in the church how, how would we begin to apply that and I got, the old, I got some of the commentators out, the scholars. How did they handle this passage? And I started reading down through this chapter in the commentators. And my first response was, dear God, do we have to go there? I was shocked. I thought it was over. I really did. I really thought we were over the worship wars. I, I thought we were over the big fights over Christian music in the church. And that's exactly where every commentator that I went to, that's what they see ripping through the church, even in the culture that we're living in now. And then I begin to reflect as I'm studying this, in the seven weeks that I was gone, the churches that I attended, that's not far from the truth. And the problem is we can't decide what a hymn is. <laughs> 
In fact, have you ever looked up a hymn in the dictionary? It just says, a song of praise to God. (laughs) Well, that don't define nothing. And then I start thinking about the churches I attended. In one church, they defined a hymn as the Gregorian chants of the Middle Ages. They think we, if we're really being traditional and getting back to the hymns, we need to go all the way back to the chants of the, of the early century. How would you like to be the minister of music in that church? And another guy came up to the minister of music. I talked to several ministers of music. And they said, yeah, I had a guy come up and say, we need to, we need to sing, let us break bread together on our knees, an old Negro spiritual. And we need to sing that every Sunday for communion. It's the only way we can really feel close to God in communion is if we sing that particular song. That was a hymn to him. I talked to some others, some pastors and places. One church I went into, they had a huge screen. Right up front, just huge. It was about, about, probably about this big, clear across the stage. And, and over here was the big pipe organs. The pipes, big pipe organ. I said to the pastor, I said, you still have pipe organ? He said, oh yeah, if you can find it up there. So during one of the rehearsals, I went up on the, on the platform of the stage, the chancel and whatever they call it, and I walked behind the screen, and, and here it was, the big console pipe organ, that the lid all closed down, dust caked over it, and a whole bunch of stuff stored and stacked on top of it. I said, what's this all about? He said, you can't get anybody to play this thing anymore. You can't even hire somebody to play this thing. But people want the pipe organ because that's how we feel close to God. I began to reflect on, the, on some of the things that took place in the churches that divide us. I walked into one church not long ago walked in and they literally had signs on the door of where you could sit based on whether they believed you were healthy or unhealthy. And they had signs and cordon off. In fact, they had two separate doors and you could decide where you sat based on your view of what is healthy or not healthy. And I thought about, well, what, what, what in the world are we coming to in these moments? And then I went in one place and somebody said, the one church, they were, they were fussing over what, what makes the hymn and the chorus. Well, the chorus is you repeat it a hundred times and, 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 and hymns don't have theology. There's been some truth to that at times, but not in these days. And then I, my mind went back to the old time when I was a kid. I was back in a little kid. I remember we singing, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love. That's a great theological hymn, isn't it? But it repeated forever and forever. I start thinking about the times I've, I've sang, I'm so glad I'm part of the family of God, 15 times in one service. We didn't complain about that. And some of the great theology of the church. And a couple of Sundays ago, we sang, Jesus, Messiah, you won't find any better theology in anything old uh, uh, that's been in the past. You won't find any better theology than Jesus, Messiah. You won't find any better theology than, Lord, we lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show us the way. Talks about the grave and the resurrection. You won't find any of that stuff any better in any hymn anywhere. And yet, that becomes the way in which we talk. And it was a simple kind of attitude and action that was going on in the church. And what happens is, we tend to take the theology and we take the biblical lessons of that and we fail to recognize that a lot of what it is is sociological and psychological it's what we prefer it's what we want now notice that the apostle paul he doesn't criticize them for wanting to be circumcised if you want to be circumcised be circumcised if you want to eat kosher like the jews go ahead and eat kosher like the jews that's not what his argument was he didn't say you can't have your preferences and they're wrong he was saying when you bring your preferences and that becomes the test of whether we're going to be close to jesus and whether we can worship together paul would absolutely say something's wrong with that kind of thinking in our lives and this was exactly what he was dealing with in the apocalypse of the church Now, in the American church, we don't have a problem with that because all we need to do is create two services. And I was in one church where they've gone to a second service, try to please everybody, and 
And, and that, that's not good enough either because you got to sing the hymn. You not only got to have the hymns, and it, it's a certain stack of hymns of the songs they like, and you can't even add a course on to the end of it or a bridge because that would be desecrating the hymn. And they were fussing over that. Uh, that's really happening in the church. Across these denominations, you say, well, that's just, that's just one. No, 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 it was across the church. And it creates divisions in the church. And the Apostle Paul comes, and he has an answer for that. He has an answer for the apocalypse in the church. And I want to give you three things today that will help the church. It will help us. It will help you to get a hold of how do we live into the new creation and how do we deal with the apocalypse in the church that is based on what I think and what I feel. I believe what the Bible says till my kid has a problem. And then I, I'll change what I believe. And Paul begins to talk about that, how to live and speak into the apocalypse. I want to give you three things this morning. The Apostle Paul gives us, here's how he was living into the apocalypse. And I'm challenging us this morning to begin to ask the Holy Spirit to help us to live into the apocalypse of the divisions of the church with these three things. The first thing is, God wants to come in living and helping us to speak into the apocalypse. God will give you a revelation. Now here's a shocking thing out of this passage. If you go to chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 1 again. Paul said... I went up in response to the, what's the word? Revelation. Do you know what that word is in the Greek? That word comes from the word apocalypse. It's the very word we get the word apocalypse. Isn't it interesting that our culture has defined apocalypse as something terrible and pessimistic in the end, but the Bible uses and defines the word as a revealing. It means to reveal something you don't know. And the Apostle Paul was in a situation in which he was asking the Holy Spirit, what do I do with the churches in Galatia? And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go up to Jerusalem and I want you to get with the apostles and I want you to confirm that the gospel you've been teaching and preaching is in line with the apostles and in line with the word of God as it had been revealed to the apostles. Now notice the Apostle Paul says, I didn't need to do that. I didn't have to do that. He could have said, phooey on the rest of you guys. I got my own gospel and Jesus gave it to me and I don't need a confirmation of the church and I don't need any authorities and I don't need a general superintendent, a district superintendent. I don't need somebody telling me what gospel I'm going to preach. But the Holy Spirit said, oh no, yes you do. You need to be tied in accountability to somebody and it's not just a private interpretation based on your feelings. You need to go confirm this so that the church sees that it is of me and that it's part of the gospel gospel and that we're all in this together though we're living it out differently in the way that the Holy Spirit leads us and so God gave Paul a revelation an apocalypse an apocalypse a revelation and it tells us that he went up in fact the Holy Spirit not only told him to go but told him what to do when he got there he went to them privately but notice that, that, that beyond that, he even gave him a revelation of what to do with Peter, who was acting in hypocrisy in the church. He told the Holy Spirit, and you can argue all day long that somehow Paul got it wrong, and his personality was brash and harsh, and he shouldn't have done that, and he wasn't very loving, and he wasn't. Based on what? Your feelings and your experience? Or can we see here this morning that the Holy Spirit gave him a revelation that said, I want you to go to these folks privately and confirm this, and I need for you to go publicly here in love, and I want you to help a brother get back in line. There's a proper place. The Holy Spirit will give you a revelation that tells you what needs to be kept private and what needs to be public. Some of us, we just need to keep our mouth shut about what we think. I reminded of my friend who talked about oftentimes we get constipation of the brain and diarrhea of the mouth. Not everything you think, not everything you feel, not everything you experience in your life you, do we need to talk about. When it causes divisions and strife and difficulty, it doesn't need to be talked about. In fact, I've been excited. I, I tell him, Pastor Stephen the other day, I think for the first time 
ever, maybe. I'm hoping. First time ever in the 20 years of Greater Life Church. They're finally, on our anniversary, they're going to sing my style of music in the gospel. I think it's going to happen. First time ever. You say, what is that, Pastor? I'm not telling you. They'll be surprised. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. What matters is Christ. What matters is that lost people are, are found. What matters is, is that people are coming to know Christ. And God the Holy Spirit will give us a revelation. I was talking to my 90-year-old father in the last few days. And he got to reminiscing about all the years of ministry. And how he walked with the Lord all these years. And he began to tell me about the times in his life when he wanted to, he thought he was done. They were moving. They were going to do something different. And, and he said, I was out and in the garden and he said the Holy Spirit came along and said you're not going anywhere son stay where you're at and work out your conflicts don't be running from your conflicts you love those people you keep on staying you stick with it and he came home that night and he said it was amazing because your mother was in the dishwater and, and, and all of a sudden she looked at me and she said I don't think we should go anywhere I think the Spirit told me today we need to stay where we're at and work out our conflicts isn't that amazing why? Because both of them were living in the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Can God do something in you to give you a revelation? It was February, the last part, the last week of February in 2020. I got up one morning to do my devotions. I always did. And as I went to read the scripture, it wasn't just normal like every morning. You know, I became aware of the presence of the Spirit of God came into the room in a way that it doesn't come every time. It's happened four or five or six times in my life. He came into the room and he told me what was going to happen March 17th. He told me what was going to happen in our culture, what was going to happen with the pandemic. And he began to talk to me about the way I was going to live. And he gave me a promise and he said, I want you to keep it to yourself, but just live into the promise. And no matter what anybody does or says, you stick with what I've told you. And there were several times in the last several years I said, Lord, is, 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 does this get included? And he'd say, you're going to believe? You're going to believe whatever you want to believe? Or are you going to believe my promise? And you know what? God's been faithful to every word of his promise that he gave me in February, long before the pandemic became a real thing. He wants to give you that kind of revelation. The second thing that I want you to notice here is that Paul not only had a revelation, but he had a testimony. He had a testimony. You say, what are you talking about that? That means he had, he had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that he could talk about. He didn't need to talk about all the other things around him. He could talk about a personal relationship with Christ where Christ came and changed his life. Chapter 1, he gives us all of that. And then in chapter 2, verse 15, here's what he says. I learned that we cannot be justified by the works of the law. Because if we are seeking to be justified by the law, then Christ would have not had to die. It, it, it makes no sense for Jesus to die if, if in the end we can somehow make, it, make ourselves right with God by what we say or do or what, what we think is the best. And the question this morning is, do you have a testimony? You see, what I'm finding in the church, I'm, I'm afraid it concerns me that too often we can talk about everything else, but I, don't, I never hear the testimony of how Jesus changed life. How, how did Jesus change your life? What was your life like before Christ? How did Christ come? What's been different since Jesus came? What if we heard more of those testimonies in our life? In fact, I dare say that in many churches that most of the people have never heard the testimonies of the other people in the church. And the truth is, we're just a bunch of religious folks who get, show up on Sunday morning, but we never share our testimony with them. When's the last time you shared your testimony with somebody and said, let me tell you what Jesus did to change my life. Let me tell you what life was like before Jesus and what happened in my life. I can tell you that even as a 10-year-old boy in Wichita, Kansas, something changed in my life. When I gave my whole life to Christ and at 17, I sold out to go with God totally and completely. My life was never the same. It has never been the same since. And Paul begins to give us his testimony of what he had done. And the fact is, most of us live into our titles, but we don't have a testimony. I was reminded in the preparation, 
There was a guy by the name of Tony Capello who used to be a professor at Eastern University, and he, um, he attended a black church as a white man, but he loved the energy. And he told about his pastor who one day at a funeral got up and his whole message for the, for the person that it was the funeral was, he began to talk about titles and testimonies. And he said, you know, they're, we're going to take this person out and they're going to do it the same to you. One of these days, they're going to take you out of the church and they're going to take you out to the graveyard and they're going to open up a grave and they're going to lower you into it and they're going to throw dirt in your face and then they're going back to the church and eat potato salad. And he said, I want to know what the, well, the only thing that will matter is whether you, doesn't matter what your title was, it's whether you had a testimony. And then he began to preach this way. He began to say, he distinguished between the title and the testimony. He said, let me tell you, Pharaoh had a title, but Moses had a testimony. Nebuchadnezzar had a title, he was king, but Daniel had a testimony. Pharaoh had a title, but Moses had a testimony. Pilate had a title, but Jesus had a testimony. Jezebel had a title, but Elijah had a testimony. Nebuchadnezzar had a title, but Daniel had a testimony. Herod had a title, but John the Baptist had a testimony. And Jesus is the center of the testimony. I want to ask you this morning, do you have a testimony? Because if you don't have a revelation and a testimony, then you're going to get caught up in the divisions of the culture and the divisions that are in the church, the apocalypse going on. If you don't have an apocalypse revelation from the Holy Spirit of God, you're going to get caught up in the apocalypse at the movie house and every place else and living in the doomsday kind of thinking in your life. And the Apostle Paul says the Holy Spirit wants to give you a revelation and he wants to give you a testimony in your life. But the last thing I notice in this passage of Scripture found in verse 19 and 20, you need to experience, if you're going to live into the apocalypse of the day we're living in, you need to experience in your own personal life a total death. You say, what in the world are you talking about, preacher? I don't want to die. Yeah, that's the problem. The Bible talks about a death not just physically. It talks about a death spiritually, in order that being crucified with Christ, you can be raised to new life in Christ, and the old passes away, and you begin to experience the freedom of the Spirit that sets you free from what you can't control, and what you're trying to uh, interpret, and what you're trying to identify with, it wants to set you free. Listen to what he said again, for through the law I died to the law. So that I may live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. What Paul died to? He didn't die, but he died to three things. He died to sin. He found in the Holy Spirit the power that we'll talk about in the days ahead. The grace of God that can deliver you from your addictions and your chains we sang about and set you free and give you a hope and a future and give you a whole new freedom that's found in Christ Jesus and take your abnormal and all of the stuff that you're trying to identify with and, and, and the people are committing suicide because they, nobody will accept their identity and he wants to change your identity and he wants to turn your identity into the identity with Christ Jesus and you die to sin and you get the grace that's the grace of God that comes along and helps us to live a holy life he wants to change you. You've been trying so hard to live right and you can't make it happen. And so you've decided it don't work and you found hypocrites in the church and you don't have to look very far to find that. But God wants to deliver you from sin. He also died to self. Oh, we need a revival of the death to self and no longer my preferences, no longer what I feel and think things should be, not what I believe should happen, but what does the Word of God? And I die to my preferences and my feelings and basing my whole life based on my feelings and experiences so that I can live for Christ. He died to self. There needs to be a death to yourself. 
I remember when that happened. In Olathe, Kansas, at 17 years of age. I was trying to define what my call was going to be. I wanted to live. It wasn't that I didn't want to live for Jesus. My struggle was not wanting to live for Jesus. It wasn't even a struggle that I didn't want to preach. But I wanted to control where I preach, when I preach, and how I preach, and who I preach to, and when and where it's going to happen. And I struggled with that for five years. I look back on that, I was crazy. Why did I struggle so long? You know why? I was afraid to let go and trust God. Because I don't trust Him. And one day I told him, I don't trust you. You've given me a new life. Let me handle it from here. I'll take my new life, do what I want to with it. And I think I can do a pretty good job. And I think you'll be pleased. And God didn't agree. He said, I made you. I know what you're gifted in. I know where you, where you need to be. And the fact is, one of the places I was never going to come, and I wrote it down. I'm not going to ever go to Iowa. <laughs> Thirty-some years later, <laughs> here I am in Iowa. God knew best. But that day, Lee Ray had to die to self. Die to my dreams. Die to my wishes. Die to who thinks what. And, and I had people got angry with me. I had an evangelist came up to me and got real mad because he thought I should be called to evangelism. And God changed the call in my life as I surrendered to him because I didn't want to be a pastor. I was wanting to be an evangelist because I could come in and stir up trouble and then leave. That's how I saw it. And I'd been through it with my dad. I saw my dad persecuted at times and difficulty. I said, man, I don't want to have to live into that. I'll just come in and, 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 and preach the gospel and then get out of town. And the Holy Spirit, when I died to self, said, no, I want you to pastor. I said, wait a minute. I don't want to do that. And I died to self. Doesn't matter what Lee Ray thinks anymore. Doesn't matter what I feel. Doesn't matter what I think my talents are. And what matters is, is what he wants in my life. And then there's a third thing that Paul died to. He died to the law. Well, what does that mean? It means he quit trying to be holy by trying to live better. He died to the law as having any ability to make him like Jesus. He said, I give up. It doesn't. I've been trying to do this for my whole life. And the more I try to, to follow the rules, the worse it gets. Now, it didn't mean he stopped doing, doing the, the, the moral things and living in holiness. It means that his source for living holy changed. He wasn't trying to see, well, how did I live up to the rules today? It was, have I lived up to what Jesus wanted in my life today? Spirit, would you show me if they've fallen short and empower me? And that's what he means when he says, I don't set aside the grace of God. And here's what's happening in the church today. We're setting aside the grace of God because here's what we don't believe. We, many of us, don't believe that the grace of God can actually transform a person and make them a different kind of person than they were before Christ. We think that what the church does is just make better people out of people. And then we're not even sure about that when we have our conflict with somebody in the church and we walk out. And the reality is, the Spirit of God wants to come and change your life. He wants to give you a new life. And it isn't about keeping the rules. It's about a relationship with Him that makes you a new person in Christ Jesus. And I want to ask you this morning, have you had a revelation? Are you living in a place where God, the Holy Spirit, can speak to you? Most generally, He speaks through His Word. I've had Him several times speak beyond that, but He speaks through His Word. And that's why we're in the Word every day, because there comes a point where the Spirit says, that is for you today, right now. And we live into that. What am I going to do at work in the, in, the, in the situation I'm in? What am I going to do in the church? What am I going to do in my job? What am I going to do with my kids? What am I going to do? Is that the Holy Spirit of God? When you seek Him, He'll give you a revelation. And then he gives, us, he gives us a testimony. And if you've not had a testimony, He wants to give you a testimony and set you free until, until you begin to talk to people. And it isn't long. You can't get far in a conversation. If the door is halfway open, you say, let me tell you what Jesus did in my life. Change me completely. Here's where I'm living. Here's where I was living. Here's where I'm at. I'm struggling here in this fact, but I'm finding victory as I live into that. I'm living in victory. And then he wants to give you a, get you to a place where you die to yourself and you die to sin and you die to the law and you die to the rules. And the only thing that matters is the new creation in Christ Jesus.
Would you bow your heads with me this morning?